All right, we're going to jump to the Word of God. First Timothy chapter number two is where we're heading this morning. First Timothy chapter number two. We are continuing a series on prayer. And uh, for many of us, uh, this is often a, somewhat of a, a hard conversation or at least a conversation that is rife with all kinds of of anxiety. How many of you uh, often can feel pretty uh, intimidated when someone asks you to pray, especially out loud? Oh, I need to have y'all come to my staff meetings more. Amen. Because usually (laughs) you start asking folks to pray and people start sweating. They start looking at the sky. Their eyes hit the flow or they get real deep and they just start closing their eyes. They just, "Mm," you know, just don't want to make any eye contact. Um, because nobody or not as many people feel as uh, comfortable engaging in prayer. But I want to suggest to you that uh, one writer says prayer is to the Christian as water is to fish, right? That you can't be a follower of Christ. You can't be someone connected to God and you don't engage in regular communication with God. And you don't allow yourself to be communicated to by God. That there is always an opportunity and a clarion call for you and I as people of God to pray. So prayer for us uh, is is a practice that I want to imagine. How can we uh, open up this idea and talk a little bit about revolutionary prayer? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, this is the lectionary passage, which turned out to be a wonderful, wonderful uh, passage that fit with some of what we've already heard today. And in the interest of time, I'm going to try to uh, cut through a little bit here. We'll read the first six, uh, we'll read the first seven verses or so, and uh, we can uh, imagine how the scriptures uh, speak to us and what they seek to teach us. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Verse number one, the word of the Lord, I'm reading from the message translation, says the first thing, everybody say the first thing, the first thing I want you to do is pray. Lord, have mercy. First things first. First thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how. For everyone you know. Pray especially for rulers and their governments to rule well so we can be quietly about our business of living simply in humble contemplation. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. He wants us not only but everyone saved. You know, everyone to get to know the truth that we've learned, that there is one God and only one, and one priest mediator between God and us, Jesus, who offered himself in exchange for everyone held captive by sin to set them all free. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So I want to talk again about the topic revolutionary prayer. Bow your heads with me and let us ask the blessings of the Lord upon our time. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the gift, Lord God, that you've given to us, the gift of prayer, the gift of communication with you, the gift of being able to speak and talk and make a connection, Lord, with you beyond our own capacity. I pray that you will bless us, bless the sermon, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you and even bless me as your preacher, send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you better pray. All right. Thank you, sir. Now, it's so important again to just remind ourselves that prayer is nothing more than communication with God. Prayer is nothing more than you making a particular effort and intention to have your life and your actions and your consciousness connected to that which is greater than you. Now, why is this so important? It's, I think, uh, a number of reasons. The first reason is because many of us need to be reminded constantly that there is someone greater than us. 
Wish I could talk to somebody in here. Amen. How many of you know that it's easy in our culture and in our country and in this uh, 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 environment to think that we have arrived, that we are the best thing since sliced bread, that our stuff don't stink, that if everybody just did things the way we wanted them to do, then the world would be a much better place. But how many of you know, even we who are smart and well-meaning, there is a way that seems right unto us. But the end can still lead us to destruction. That your good intentions and my uh, uh, well-meaning motives don't always add up to the kind of results that we want, and in many cases, you can be doing what you think to be the right thing and still end up in such a mess that you realize, man, I, maybe I should have sought God first. See, <laughs> I, I find that I'm going to pray either way. I'm going to pray on the front end, or I'm going to pray on the back end. You understand what I'm saying? I wish I could talk to somebody here today. How many know that you you going to pray either way? You ought to tell your neighbor, you're going to pray either way. Now, I'm just trying to give you some good advice. If I must pray, why not pray so I can have as much information and, and as much influence and as much guidance as I need so I can be moving in the direction of the will of God? My brothers and sisters, prayer is such an important uh, practice, not because it changes the mind of God, but mostly because it changes the one who prays. Now, I am one who, who, who you know, last week before we had our guest speaker, I was going to talk about uh, how you should pray. And I had all these nice diagrams, and I was going to talk about, you know, I was playing a layout on the flow, and I praying to kneel like Kaepernick. You know, I had all these nice little gimmicks that I was going to talk about. But because I'm collapsing a couple sermons into one, you're just going to have to use your imagination. But I do want to submit to you that there are many kinds of ways and postures that you and I can employ when we are trying to pray, particularly praying in a revolutionary manner. I like to suggest and submit that while praying is, 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 is indeed at its root a, a, a mode of communication to God, sometimes just like an antenna on a TV, your posture can often signal and help shape you in a certain way so you are praying with a particular intention in mind. I've become more appreciated of somatics in, in the last uh, several you know, years. Somatics is this idea where your body has certain kind of postures and your blood flow and your circulation and your spirit and mind can be a little better aligned if you did certain kind of postures rather than you just being tight and you know, whatnot all the time sitting up in a chair with your back straight all the time or slouched over. Somatics helps you to get centered and do all these different kind of uh, practices to help your body be more aligned with your spirit. And in the same way, I want to submit to you that there are all kind of ways that you can pray. I, I, I have this one diagram, at least that I'll show, that gives you a sense of all the many ways you can pray. Understanding the postures of prayer help you to appreciate that the position is not important, but the position can help determine and influence your attitude towards God. So in Scripture, you find that some people prayed while they were standing up. And standing before the Lord in prayer often reflected this this hungering and this thirsting for God. It, it was a posture that allowed you to pray with not only hunger and thirsty uh, a kind of feelings and sensibilities, but it gave you a sense of authority that you have the right to be there. So when you pray and you're standing up, you are actually helping your body, your mind, and your spirit 
Be reminded that you have been given authority by God to boldly approach the throne of grace. That prayer is something that God beckons you to do. God gives you a license as his child to come and seek him out whenever you need to talk to God. Versus you being timid and like, oh, shucks, uh, God, I don't, um, hmm, um, I don't know if, if I should pray. No, when you stand, you should stand with authority. God, I'm here because you told me I belong in your presence seeking your face. Another posture of prayer you may see up there is, folks, kneeling or bowing. Let's go, let's go with bowing. When you bow before the Lord in prayer, it conveys an attitude of honor, gratitude, and faith. Bowing in prayer helps you, helps you to appreciate that you're not coming out of fear. You're coming out of honor and reverence. And how many of you know in this world where nobody likes to give anybody any props, credit, or honor, you better practice bowing before somebody. And that somebody better be God. There's a posture of prayer that, that, that is about kneeling before God. And sometimes you got to kneel before the Lord because how many of you know we make mistakes? And kneeling before God is a posture of repentance. It is a posture of saying, I want you, God, to know that I need mercy and forgiveness. It helps order your heart in a way where you just don't forget that your stuff stinks. That you are in need of God's mercy. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long you've been following Jesus. I don't care how many uh, titles you have in front of your name. You who can't kneel before God have been filled with all kinds of hubris, pride, and arrogance. The preacher, the nun, the pope, the sinner, and the saint, everybody got to kneel before God and be like, God, I am in need. Of your mercy. I go on and on and on, but like I said, that was a whole sermon, so I just give you a little abbreviated version. This is an important practice that you and I should employ regularly. Why? Because when you practice these postures of prayer, I want to submit they will help shape your mind and your heart and your soul. As you move throughout a world that is violently against your existence. You need to be connected to someone greater than you that can remind you whether you're kneeling, standing, bowing, that you are a child of the creator of the universe. You need to be in constant communication with someone that can help you realize even when you mess up, your mistakes don't have to determine the rest of your life. You need to be connected to someone that can help you appreciate that your help does not come from the north, the south, the east, or the west, but your help comes from the creator of heaven and earth. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, you better pray, you better pray, you better pray. So when we come to the book of 1 Timothy, we see this as a letter to the, the young man who was an apprentice of Paul. Now, Paul, for good or for bad, was one of these folk who had an overdetermined impact, not just on the, the Christian writings of Scripture, but actually on the ways in which our whole uh, re, uh, uh, tradition of the Christian faith has definitely been impacted. Paul was one of these folk. If you look at his history, he was one of the most well-educated. He was one of the most, uh, uh, he had dual citizenship. He was a Roman and he was a Jew. He had all kinds of, all kinds of privileges that he could access and tap into. And yet Paul really realized that he could not depend on his pedigree, his education, or his status. Paul wrote most of his letters from jail. 
which makes you understand that God always loves folk who are in jail. Hello, somebody. That you being in jail, both literally or figuratively, does not disconnect you from God's ability to use you, talk to you, or even bless the whole world. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I thank God for jail. I thank God for jail. Amen. I thank God for jail. Because some of us need a time out. Y'all not helping me preach this morning. Amen. I tell the young people all the time when we're working with them on our, on our vice prevention program, I say, listen, if you refuse to stop shooting folk after I'm begging and pleading with you, give you some help and offer you some program and even sometimes offer you a little money, and you can't stop shooting folk, you need a timeout. You do. You need some time away, and I will come visit you, and I will come talk to you, and I will be an advocate for you coming back home when you're ready to stop shooting and harming and hurting. How many know all of us sometimes need a timeout? And guess what? Well, I'm just here to tell you, if you don't take the timeout yourself, God knows how to lay you out. Mm -hmm. Some of you know you heard God the best. When you was laid out on your back, you couldn't go nowhere else. It's like, God, like, I want you to pray. Oh, God, I'm too busy. I want you to fast. Oh, God, I'm too hungry. I want you to forgive. Oh, God, they too trifling. And then God lays you out. <laughs> then you're like, oh, yeah, God. I hear your voice oh, so clear. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Amen. You have to understand that even at our worst, God can still achieve his best. If we are willing to be connected to God, Paul writing to his mentee, Timothy, a young man who was trying to figure out how in the city of Ephesus, one of the most uh, diverse and 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 uh, 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 differentiated cities around religious worship. Paul is trying to help Timothy appreciate. Listen, if you are going to be a good follower and minister and representative of Jesus, this is what you must do. First thing he said is you got to pray. Prayer has to be your priority. Somebody holler priority. You must make sure that every day you wake up, before you check your stocks, before you check Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Gmail. Hello, somebody. Am I down your road yet? Before you check any of that, you need to check in with God. Prayer must be your priority. Because if you're not checking in with God, who then is helping to order your day? What you think about that? Who's helping to order your day if you're not first talking to God? I know you're busy, especially all you who wake up five minutes before you got to be somewhere. <laughs> God, I, pr I, I pray you help me to get where I got to be on time. Somebody say, first things first. You must pray. Some of us are too busy to pray. That means that you have fully been seduced and taken over by these capitalistic, hegemonic forces that make you think you are too busy to talk to the creator of your soul? This country depends on you being too busy to pray. Because they know if you ain't talking to God, then you talking to everybody else. Some of us need to get a prayer partner. Somebody that, you know, can just pull our coats up and be like, hey, did you pray today? Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Oh, I'm, you ain't too busy to pray. Because Scripture says 
the first thing you need to do is pray. So, you know, because many of us are so busy and we can't carve it into our regularly scheduled day, I want to ask you, why don't you use the times where we pray here at church or in the small groups? Sometimes you just got to take a time out from all this other stuff we doing. Because how many of that stuff going to be there when you get done praying? And certainly God's going to be there too. But like I said, I'd rather console God on the front end than on the back end. So a couple questions you ought to ask yourself simply. What must you do to make first things first and pray? Are you too busy to pray daily? Do you have a prayer partner who can help hold you accountable? Do you take advantage of the weekly scheduled times to pray? What must you do to make sure that prayer, not prayer while you, you know, making a fool of yourself, you know, oh, I, I, I hope to God I don't have to bust you. You know, I hope you better, God help me not to curse you. You know, that's, that, that is some prayer, but that's not the kind of prayer I'm talking about. I'm talking about you getting some focused, committed time to slow down everything. And say, God, I need to hear from you. I've got too much hell on my job and in my family and my community to not slow this train down. Just say, God, let me hear from you. Why is that revolutionary? Because it is, listen, it is a counteract to the systems and pace of life that seek to cause you to run until you can't run anymore. Prayer reminds you that the time schedule you think overdetermines you can always be trumped by the eternal timeline of God. In a time of busyness, prayer makes you sit down and say, God, I'm not too busy to just hear from you. I'm not too busy to read a song. Sing a song. Sit quietly and wait for you to s touch me and speak and, and, and gently nudge me in my life and my decisions in a certain direction. Lord, help me to pray every day. Help me to spend some time every week just hanging out. It has to be your priority. The second thing the scripture says is verse number, uh, verse number one. It also says, pray every way you know how. Listen for everyone you know. Prayer is revolutionary when it is an act of intercession. Everybody say intercession. Now, you know, it's so important to appreciate that it's easy to pray for people you like. I wish I could tell the truth. It's easy. Oh, God, bless my mom and them. Bless my daddy. Bless my boo. Bless my kids. Bless my, my good co-worker. Bless, bless, bless my study partner who does what they're supposed to do. Bless that professor that gives me an A. Bless, you know. But then when it comes to folk you don't like, it just becomes a groan. Hmm. <laughs> God, you know my heart. Hmm. But the scripture says that we should pray for our leaders, rulers, authorities. Why? So we can live a quiet life. Now I got to park here just for a second because some people would take that, uh, that second clause to, to be the, the qualifying statement of the first clause. That I should only pray and then go live a quiet life. But I think it's important to appreciate that we are praying for just leaders, for good bosses, 
for healthy parents and leaders of homes and families so the lives that we live can be filled with justice and peace. So more of our time, if not all of our time, can be spent on reconnecting with God and God's creation. You have to appreciate, my brothers and sisters, that prayer should not replace your actions of doing justice and mercy, cultivating relationships, being healthy. Prayer should be a catalyst that helps to create those kinds of outcomes and realities. Intercession then means that you have to learn to pray not just for the people you like, but for the people who do you harm. You got to pray for them. I'm not praying for them. You better pray for them now. Because I believe. Uh, I think Jonathan Edwards, he said at one time, what a terrible thing it is for the sinner to fall into the hands of an angry God. Now, I'm not so high and holy that I don't think that that could be talking about me. Because, you know, I don't want to be in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> I don't want God to ever put me in his hands when he's angry. Amen. Because that could be some problems. But I do believe that God can move kings. God can move systems. God can change folk minds. God can do that. I've seen God do it. I know God's done it. We have all kinds of examples in Scripture. When Pharaoh didn't want to let the people go, it took about 10 tries. But Pharaoh was like, oh, snap. I better let these folk go not eat you because I may not have nothing left. Keep fooling around with this God they praying to. See, I believe that you and I, our act of prayer can help us be reminded, even with our leaders, both political and spiritual, moral, neighborhood leaders. I pray for Pookie. I pray for those youngst youngsters who, who run the streets, you know, because they're leaders in the streets that ain't thinking about you, me, nobody else. I lift up their name. Lord, when I need peace in the community, I pray that Pookie will tell his homies to stand down till we can figure out how to get this thing situated. How many know there's street leadership out there that you got to pray for? <laughs> Hello, somebody. These political leaders, Lord knows we better pray for these jokers because they don't have a right bone or I don't know what they're thinking about these days. We got to pray for them, why? So their decisions do not create more and more chaos and harm in the world. But I love what Frederick Douglass said. He said it best. He said, praying for freedom did not help me as much until I started praying with my feet. So prayer as intercession is also about you being moved to act. God, help me to pray in a way where I'm just not caught in one of those postures I, we were doing earlier. But God, as soon as I get up out of those postures, I'm still doing an act of prayer as I vote, as I teach, as I mentor, as I do peacemaking work, as I heal, as I hug, as I love. Lord, let my whole life be an act of intercessory prayer. But we have to keep the right focus, my brothers and sisters, and keep the right targets. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Everybody you think is in charge in that seat of power are often being moved by forces both unseen and unaware to the rest of us. But guess what? God is never fooled by the unseen forces. So God, I pray that as we do this work of ministry, in the world. Lord, I want to pray for my leaders. I want to intercede on behalf of those in my family. 
How many know folk in your family that you know if God don't help them, they just won't be helped? I mean, you've done everything you can. You sent them every program. You have gave them every bill. He, I mean, you, 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 you forgiven them 70 times 7. And you're like, do I got to do 491? Sometimes your intercession has to be, Lord, I, now I'm officially giving this over to you. And, and, and sometimes, you know, those folk we don't want to pray for, sometimes we got to change our prayer up a little bit. Lord, help me, listen, help me to have what I need to have so I can pray for my enemies. That is an act of formation itself. Because when you're praying for someone that you know has your worst interests at heart, you are now robbing them of the power they think and maybe even you think they have. And you are repositioning the power analysis now. You're repositioning to help folk realize that you may think you a king, but I know the ruler of heaven and earth. You may think you in charge, but I know the one that could even make you lie down in green pastures. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them intercession, intercession, intercession. So let me get these questions. Are there some folks you find hard to pray for? Who are they? This week you ought to make a list of them. It's a good practice. Make a list of these folk you find hard to pray for. and Just put them on your, on your refrigerator. Put them on your mirror. When you look at it, you just start shaking your head. I mean, no, you don't know you don't do that. You say, just, just say, Lord, in the name of Jesus. You know, you know what these folk need. Because I don't know what to say about these folk. But you know. Start praying for these folk and watch how God turns that cold heart into something warm. Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, God says that God knows how to turn that heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Think about the power of God, what God can do if God can change the composition of a thing. To bend it according to God's will, why would you not want to pray for your leaders? Why would you not want to pray for these folk that their heart turns? Why would you not want to pray for these folks through actions that that make them do the right thing or you kind of help them move on to the next phase of their life. Prayer is intercession. Last thing I'll say, prayer is revolutionary when it becomes an act of liberation. Somebody holler liberation. Jesus said, or the scripture says that we must pray to Jesus. Why? Because he is the sole mediator who comes to set us all free from sin. Prayer as an act of liberation should remind you that at the end of the day, what good is it to have the whole world and still be bound? Liberation. Prayer is an act of liberation. Prayer is revolutionary when it becomes a source of our liberation. Now, many of you heard me say this all the time or often, that the first revolution is always in internal revolution. That for all the praying and all the hoping that we want to see changed outside of us, sometimes God is actually trying to change us because it is in the changing of us that we could change then our outside situation. And there are often moments and times where we are praying and we're asking God to do some liberating and we forget that the liberation we seek has to be connected to the liberator. The one who is the champion of freedom and liberation. The one who has a track record of never letting God's people down. The one who helps us be reminded that there is a, a source of liberation that does not depend on who's in office does not depend on who likes you or does not like you. That does not depend on the money in your bank account, but the source of liberation is the one who can liberate both the soul and the body. This liberator 
We call his name Jesus. We call his name Jesus because time and time again through the life that he lived, he demonstrated to us that there was a, a, a particular situation that nobody else could work out, but somehow Jesus figured it out. There was a circumstance that had to do with the healing of someone's body and every doctor had been visited, but somehow just touching the hem of this liberator's garment. There was a political environment that everybody thought liberation was coming from one place, but this new kind of prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, giving us a new sense of what it means to have a system that does not depend on the oppression of the other, but on the liberation of everyone. I love this liberator because we who come from a tradition that reminds us that there are always moments and opportunities where our own liberation can feel so distant and so far. But we are reminded by the songs of the old saints. They used to say, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your problems. He'll hear your faintest cry. And he'll answer by and by. Have a little talk with Jesus. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him you ought to talk to Jesus today. Because it is in the talking to Jesus that you may get a little bit better direction on the liberation process that you are trying to engage. You see, I find it so interesting that when I'm looking for the liberation of my body and my soul, too often I go to Jesus last. Or certainly I don't go to him first. But then I always end up right where I should have started. Anybody ever were looking for some answers and you looked at every other option and then at the end you said, Lord, have mercy. Why didn't I just start with Jesus? Why didn't I start with seeking out the face and the voice of God? My brothers and sisters, prayer that is revolutionary will always connect you back to the one who started the revolution. And we that are Christians, I believe we are part of this Jesus revolution. We are part of a revolution of, 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 a, of a, a, a radically obedient person who reminded us that the greatest act that one can do is an act of love, an act of surrender, an act of forgiveness, an act of salvation. And when we seek liberation, we must not seek liberation using the tools of the oppressor, the tools of the empire. But we must be reminded that the weapons we fight with are not of human origin, but they're mighty through God. To pull down strongholds, I pray because I'm getting in touch with these tools through God. And if I keep it real, sometimes my prayers don't, they feel like they ain't going past the ceiling. Whenever I feel like my prayer ain't going past the ceiling, I change my posture. Well, maybe I need to lay down. I need to lay prostrate before the Lord. That didn't help. Maybe I need to kneel. But whatever I got to do, I'm going to pray, as the scripture says, in Every way I know how. Because I believe that this prayer, this, this tool of prayer, is one of my most important assets to engaging and sustaining the revolution of my body, my soul, and dare I say the world. Come on, stand with me, everyone, and let's take a few moments. 